All right, now it's time to embarrass some people, but I think it's a good kind of embarrassment. We want to acknowledge people that are faithful in their service to Jesus Community Church. I've, I've fallen out of the habit of giving thanks. I want to get back into that. Um, Tim and Shelley, would you guys just stand up real quick? Just real quick. Ready? I want to let you guys know how much these, these people do for our church. They take care of the Operation Christmas Child. They take care of the nursing home ministries. Tim works with the, the worship team. Uh, Shelly, for those of you that don't know, Shelly takes care of our Facebook page, keeps everything updated on our Facebook page. Without being overt in their service, they're working diligently and they're accomplishing many things on behalf of Jesus Community Church. So this morning, I want to say on behalf of Jesus Community Church, thank you. Uh, before we get into the message, there's a couple things that I want to address. Uh, yesterday, we had the privilege, Christy and I went up to Missoula, um, and we got to meet with the Christian Motorcyclists Association, and then we caravaned over to um, the Missoula Alliance Church, and we got to witness the uh, families that received the gifts that you guys donated. <coughs> there is a slideshow, if you would... Perfect. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you can see the number of gifts. This doesn't do it justice. <coughs> Excuse me. That were donated. Each family comes in and they're given a number and they're called up by number. They get an opportunity to have a picture taken with uh, Santa and Mrs. Claus which is Gordy and Deb, <laughs> in, incognito. <coughs> and then they, they get to take the children in, and each of the children get to pick a toy. They get to choose whatever one they want. 23 families were ministered to yesterday. Families, not children. Families. <coughs> Good grief. <coughs> Steve, I'm borrowing a lot of them. Actually, I'm just going to keep it. I'm not giving it back. <coughs> this only happens one day a week. <coughs> okay. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. You see our... our Santa and Mrs. Claus. Um, I don't know how many toys were actually handed out yesterday. There were hundreds in the room. There were a significant portion left over after these families came through, which is a good thing because all of this is done in conjunction with the Child Development Center. The Child Development Center will actually take those gifts door to door to the families that weren't able to come. And so I wanted you guys to be able to see. Um, go ahead and, uh, there, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there I am, clueless. Robin, we are discussing deep and theological doctrinal issues. <laughs> I don't know what they were. I think it was his coffee. <laughs> um, but you can see a lot of the children that got to come through. All of these families, in some way or another, have special needs children. Um, it was a tremendous blessing and I wanted you guys to see so you could understand the blessing that you guys are when you donate and you put a toy in a box you don't often associate it with a face well these are the faces this is this is who you're blessing okay so um, this is the group there are several different groups that actually unite to gather toys for this uh, it's not just a Christian motorcycle association uh, bikers for Christ is involved the uh, Harley Owners Group is involved. There, there's, I think there's one or two others, correct? Bikers, or... Uh, bullies. Bikers Against Bullies. Bikers Against Bullies. So, um, this is a community coming together 
to bless to reach out and reach into the homes of these people. So I just wanted you guys to be able to see, um, and that's not even all the people that were involved. So awesome. Thank you, uh, Gordy and Deb. Thank you, Robin and Carolyn, for bringing that to our attention and, and letting us reach out into the community. Um, I've got stacks of notes. For some reason, Christy doesn't think that I can remember stuff, mostly because I don't. Uh, I've got a couple Ask the Pastor questions that I want to address. One that has been, I've been sitting on for a little while because I've been trying to find information. See this? Everybody, everybody see this? It's been up at the front. I, I had to pull it out because we took all the decorations down to put decorations up. <laughs> Um, but the question is, please speak to the meaning behind the picture on the wall at the front of the church to the left of the cross. That's this picture. Um, for those of you that don't know, this is the, uh, an illustration of the Western Wall. It's also known as the Wailing Wall. This is the closest that Jews today can come to where the temple sat and they can pray. They're not allowed to pray going up onto the mountain. Uh, it's actually illegal for them to pray up on the mountain uh, because it it's, uh, belongs to the Muslims. Okay? So the Jews gather here and they've got it partitioned into two sections, men and women. And they, they will gather and they will, uh, if you've ever seen a Jew that's, that's praying and, and they're in worship, they rock. They rock. And um, you will see them, sometimes hundreds of them up there rocking and praying. They will write out uh, prayers on pieces of paper and they'll insert it into the cracks. See, the Jews are still looking for the Messiah to come. They're looking for the temple to be rebuilt. They're looking for the anointed one to come and deliver them. And I think what is so awesome about this picture is that in, in their ignorance, they're worshiping and praying and asking God for something to come that has already come. Um, I, I kind of make light of this, but when, when we went to Israel, we got to go to the Western Wall, and I, I kind of had built this thing up in my mind. I was going to go to the wall. I was going to be at the place, closest place that I could possibly be to the very manifest presence of God. And uh, because it's a Jewish site, you're required to wear a, a covering, a head covering, a kippah or a yarmulke, and, and they have a, a bucket of them. And so I went up, and I bowed my head down, and I was ready for this incredible experience. And a bird pooped on me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was an experience. And my first thought was, really? You animal of the devil. That's a Muslim bird. <clears throat> and, and just very softly and very gently, God revealed to me that, that he's, he's not stuck up on that mountain anymore. The veil has been rent. His spirit has gone out. We can come into the presence of God anytime, day or night, anywhere we are. And I think that's what is so awesome about this picture. Now, you notice Jesus is wearing the, the prayer shawl. Jesus was a Jew. He came to the Jews. He lived as a Jew. He obeyed their laws. <clears throat> we see that he celebrated their feasts, <clears throat> even the ones that were not necessarily um, proscribed in Scripture. Because the promise was that through them, God would bless the world. Okay, So when you pray, pray for Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray that God would reveal himself to the Jews. Because I think what this is speaking right here is that the Jews are seeking something that's already been found. And, and look, he's ministering to them. God's heart is for that people. And he will fulfill his promises to them. There will be a time when, when everything that he has promised them will come to pass. So, question number one. Question number two, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 19. Okay. 
uh, verse 16 says, And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. Okay? Now the question being, is why would Jesus redirect and say, you know, this, this is not an unusual greeting. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, all three of the synoptic gospels tell the same story in almost the exact same words. And in one of the gospels, it says, uh, the, the man called him good teacher. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? So the question is, why would Jesus ask, why would Jesus bring this up as a point of contention? It says, uh, Jesus, whoops. Uh, Jesus told him, there is none good but one, that is God. Jesus is the God man. I can't think of anyone more good then God, God equals Jesus. You're right. You're absolutely right. I don't think Jesus was saying, uh, don't call me good because only God is good. I think Jesus was speaking to this rich young ruler and to all of the people around him. He was proclaiming his deity. He was, because we've seen this throughout the ministry of Jesus, several times. At one point he says, uh, before Abraham was, I am. And the Jews freaked out. And they're like picking up rocks to chuck at him. And it's like, what? what? Okay. Because what he was doing, that, that phrase, I am, that's the name for God. And so when he says, I am, he is declaring himself to be God. Which is... A stoning offense. If it's a lie. Okay? In another place, he calls himself the Son of God. And the Jews gather up rocks again. They have this thing about rocks. And they're going to chuck them at him. And they say, well, what, what, what sin have I committed? They said, well, you have called yourself the Son of God. You have made yourself equal to God. I think in this statement right here, Jesus is saying, not, I'm not good. I think he's saying, yeah, I am good. I am God. And I think most of the people just whoop, right over their heads. Because if you look, nobody, nobody got stones. Okay? So he says, why do you ask me about what is good? Or, or why do you call me good in another version? Uh, there is only one who is good. And, and who is? Who is good? God. And, and so if... God is good and Jesus is God, Jesus is good. I think what he's doing is he's, he's challenging this and he's making the man think about what he said. Because this man comes to Jesus and calls him good master and asks what good thing he must do. And Jesus says, hey, look, look, I am good. As a matter of fact, I can be good with two O's or one. Because I am God. So short answer, yes. Good equals God equals Jesus. Okay? All right. We have a couple more Ask the Pastor questions that I will get to in the upcoming weeks. Uh, those of you that ask these questions, I will leave them up here at the front. If you have your Bibles, open to Leviticus chapter 23. We are working through the feasts. Uh, we've covered the Passover feast. We talked about Jesus being our Paschal Lamb, our Passover Lamb, the Lamb that was given and sacrificed for us. We've talked about the Sabbath. We're moving on. Now, now this is, this is a, kind of a touchy area, and there's a lot of disputation specifically within the Jews as to how this all works because if you look down uh, I'm going to start verse 1 and 2 then I'm going to skip 3 and get down to 4 and 5 okay so read with me it says the Lord spoke to Moses saying speak to the people of Israel and say to them these are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy 
convocations. They are my appointed feasts. Okay? So this is not like they just decided they were going to do something. God decided for them and told them, you will do this. All right? So down in verse 4 it says, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord, for seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, but you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. <laughs> On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. Okay, so here's the dilemma. And, and historically... There have been two views on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The first is that, where, where does the time fall? And, and we have two opposing views. At the time of Christ, the Sadducees held to the view that there was the Passover feast on the 14th and, and wrapped over. Because remember, their day starts at twilight. And then when that was finished, the Feast of Unleavened Bread started on the 15th and carried on through the 21st. Okay? Their view was that it was two separate events. A Feast for Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Pharisees said, no, it's actually all one thing joined. And so they said, we, we start on the 14th and we go to the 21st, but it's all one thing. And, and there was a, a big dis, d debate over this. And at the time of Jesus... Interestingly enough, the Gospels tell us when they refer to the, the Passover feast, they actually refer to it by the Pharisees' view, calling it the uh, Passover, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay? Now, you guys probably read that over and you went, oh, it meant, means nothing to you. But the fact that they're saying it was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Passover, tells us that the writers and and the people that were involved are subscribing to the Pharisees' view that it's the beginning of the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is Passover. It's not two separate things. It's one thing. Okay? So, on the 15th, they began a, 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 a celebration. And on the first day of the feast, it was no work. No regular work. Okay? It's a holy convocation. What, what is a holy convocation? Gathering. The gathering of the righteous. Okay? And, and they were directed, you do no ordinary work. The food that you were going to eat that day had to be prepared the day before. You had to have your animals taken care of so that you didn't have to go out and feed them and water them and all of that. No regular work. Okay? Now, there are a number of points because Scripture actually addresses this feast numerous times in the Old Testament, but only touches on it a few times in the New Testament. So, uh, I'm going to give you the Scripture references. Obviously, we have Leviticus 23. Um, Exodus chapter 12, 15 through 20. Just write this down, okay? Uh, because if we spend the time reading all of these passages, I won't get to what I believe is the, the heart of this thing. Okay, so Exodus chapter 12, uh, verses 15 through 20. Okay? <clears throat> this is right as, as uh, Israel has is, is been delivered from Egypt, the, the Passover has happened, the, the angel of death has gone over, and, and God has declared to the people, you need to remember, folks, you got to remember this. When God says remember, you got to remember this. So when you read in Scripture where God says remember, pay attention, because you need to remember too. All right? Because the whole point of every one of these feasts is for them to remember. Either remember what God had done, or remember what God was doing, or remember what God was, has said He would do. Okay? And in a lot of cases, it's all three at the same time. So the second one, Exodus chapter 23, uh, verses 14 through 15. This is the passage that talks about the three feasts that all the males in Israel were required to present themselves before God. First at the tabernacle in Shiloh, and then 
uh, and the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, and, and we'll get into those a little bit later. Um, the third passage. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 16, and it's a, a series of verses from chapter 3 to, I'm sorry, from verse 3 to verse 16. It's mentioned in sequence in a number of verses in there. Okay, so there's another passage, and, and I'm not reading these because I'm going to draw out from these all of the directives that are given. Because they build one upon another. Alright? Uh, second to last, we have 2 Chronicles chapter 30. Verses 23 through 27. Uh, historically, this was uh, Hezekiah. Um, he, he had reinstituted the worship and, and they were going to celebrate. As a matter of fact, they celebrated for seven days and then they agreed to celebrate another seven days. And, and that seven days was the feast of unleavened bread. And then the last one is Ezra chapter 6. Ezra 6 verses 21 and 22. Now this one is kind of unique amongst all of the Old Testament scriptures because up to this, all of these had taken place before the fall of Jerusalem. Okay, Before the Assyrians... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Babylonians came in and they broke down the walls of Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. They stripped it of all of its valuables and they took that and a bunch of the people from Israel and they deported them all throughout the, the country of Babylon. Okay? This is after they come back. The temple has been rebuilt and the people are celebrating. They actually had to go through a process because they had to make the, sure that the priests were sanctified and that the Levites were sanctified. And then after doing this, they were able to then sanctify the people so that they could celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So we see a number of passages there. I'm going to touch on the New Testament in a minute. But I want to draw out from each of these passages some of the things that were required for the celebration that we see, God speaks to him and says, do this. Okay? Um, number one, the Jews were commanded of God to celebrate. This is a directive. It's not a, you know, if you kind of feel like it, you know, you don't have anything else going on. Or if you, if, you know, you really have time. I don't want to in, intrude. I don't want to interrupt your busy schedule. But no, God is saying, you will do this. Okay? And this is a command that is every bit as etched in stone as any of the ones given in the Ten Commandments. Okay? God is telling Israel, you will do this. Number two, now this is an interesting thing. Leaven was to be removed from the houses, completely taken out of the houses for that entire week. Okay? What's interesting about this is uh, one of the later passages actually says that the leaven is to be removed from the land. They're actually supposed to take it all completely out and get rid of it. Um, now, the Jews being practical people, they ran into some problems. What, what about somebody that sells bread and has a business with where, whereby they actually make a living by leaven? They came up with a way to deal with that. They would sell their business for the period of seven days to a Gentile. And at the end of the seven days, the Gentile would sell it back. So they, this is how their mind works on this thing. Um, so, when, when God says, take it out of your house, he, He's not saying, you know, I'll just store it away in a safe place. He's saying, get rid of it. Get, have, be done with it. Okay? And now, keep in mind, the Passover, they had to get rid of the leaven. So, that's the first day. And then you have the seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So, there's, there's eight days where there is no leaven in the house. And then, Scripture says, get rid of it out of the land. Okay? I cannot find anywhere that confirms that the Jews ever got it out of the land. I see nothing in Scripture that, that tells me one way or the other. They very well may have, but knowing how things went, you know, because we get to look back on history, I'm, I'm guessing they didn't. All right? So, next instruction. Um, the first and the last days were holy convocations. 
They were, they were holy days. All of the week is holy, but the first one and the last one, they are specifically directed to not do any work. Okay? Uh, why is this important? Because God is mandating a period of rest for His people. This is something that uh, we as Americans, we need to pay attention to because we don't tend to rest. We're busy, 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 busy. And we, we do our jobs Monday through Friday, and then we pack everything we possibly can into Saturday and Sunday because we've only got those two days to get it done. And then we go back to work on Monday exhausted because we have not rested. Folks, there is a principle, a dynamic at work the way in which God constructed people to function, He has required them to have regular rest. Okay? I think this is, this is why the Sabbath was so important from a physiological point. God was not doing that because He was being snooty and saying, you know, I want one full day. You can have the other six, I want one full day. I think God was looking in both directions. He understood man's need to rest to recover, to not let himself get overly busy. Okay? Uh, also, if you have time, look in the, uh, the law and you will see that God actually mandated a rest for the land every seventh year. Mm -hmm. That the land itself could, could rest. See, God knows how the creation was designed because <laughs> He did it. He knows it needs a rest. Okay, so the next thing. Um, so the, the first and the last day were holy convocations. They were days of rest. No work was to be done. Uh, number five, the feast was mandatory because it commemorates God's deliverance of Israel from Egypt. Okay, so it's not just enough that God just whipped out a, a holiday and said, we're going to have a, a, a day of rest here. You know, um, it might be a good idea to do gift exchange on that day. Or, you know, this, this would be the day to eat turkey. Or, or it, God did this for a purpose so that they would remember. If you read throughout Scripture, over and over and over again, we're taught, we're, we need to remember. Okay, It's so easy for us to forget uh, within a generation of, of the Israelites coming into the promised land um, that they, they have children that are born and raised in the promised land that never knew what it was like to travel. That never knew what it was like to be in slavery. And so God told them, you've got to do this so that the future generations will remember. Okay? So not only is this a directive of God, but it's a directive for a purpose. Okay? So next thing. Um, now this is, this is pretty significant. It says that anyone that violated the feast, anyone that ate leavened bread, or anyone that worked on the, the holy days of holy convocation, they were to be cut off from Israel. They're, they're disinherited. They're disenfranchised. They're boop. They're given the boot. Okay? Now, Scripture doesn't say that they were actually physically ejected from the land, but they were, they were removed from the fellowship of being a Jew. Their, their rights to come into the temple, gone. You're no longer one of us. You have violated a direct command by the Father. Now, we don't have a lot of commands that carry with it this kind of punishment. Quite honestly, some of the ones where God says, hey, you know, you catch them doing this, kill them. I think that would be an easier price to pay than being a pariah in your own land among your own people. Okay? So, this is how serious God is taking this feast. If you violate this, you are to be cut off. Um, number seven, the feast was to begin on the 15th of the first month. Does anybody remember the name of the first month? Nisan. Nisan. It's also called Abib, Abib or Abib, depending on how it's spelled. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, it's Abib or Aviv. And, and then at some point in the history, the Jews changed the name. You know one of the things I hate? I can't stand it when they put out a new operating system for my computer and they move stuff just to have moved it. <laughs> Why? It has always been here and now you've moved it over here. Why? What advantage is that to me? None. Leave it alone. You want to make it faster? Make it faster. You want to make it look more cool? Make it look more cool. Leave it alone. Don't touch where it's supposed to be. Okay? And they do that consistently. Okay, you got to go here and then, then oh, oh, wait a minute, it's not here anymore. What version are you using? 
Oh yeah, I forgot, I forgot. You gotta go over here to get to that, and then it'll bring you over here. I hate that. But somewhere in the history of the Jews, they took the first month and they said, oh, it's no longer this, it's this. Okay, so if you hear uh, Nisan or, or Aviv or Aviv, it's all the same month. Okay, so when you're reading your Bible and, and it says on the 15th of Aviv or the 15th of Aviv or the 15th of Nisan, don't trip up. Okay, it, that's, it's okay. <clears throat> For those of us that just adore change. <clears throat> okay, number eight, an offering was to be made. Actually, uh, in, in the early passage of Scripture, it says there is an offering that is to be made. Uh, the offering is to include uh, two young bulls, a ram, seven one-year-old male lambs, a grain offering where they would take fine flour and they'd mix it with pure oil, and then the last thing was a, a, a male goat as a sin offering. Now, you go, why is this important? Because God said all of this is to be done separate from your regular, regular offerings. Okay? Everything that I told you to do day by day, you continue to do. But on these days, I want these things as well. When we read a little bit later into those scriptures, we actually see that those offerings were to be offered every day of the feast. Now, why is that important to us? Because Christ took care of all that. He is our sacrifice. Okay, now um, we're running low on time. I want to get to the nugget of this. I want to get to the heart of this. We know that Jesus fulfilled the Passover, but Jesus also fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Throughout Scripture, in almost every case that leaven is mentioned, almost every case, it is always associated with sin. Okay, now. We see that God says, hey, on the Passover, no, no leaven. Okay, because the, the sacrifice is to be pure, to be spotless without blemish. Okay, as a matter of fact, they were told to inspect it for four days before it was sacrificed to make sure there was nothing wrong with it. Okay, but then the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread goes an additional seven days. And, and God is speaking to Israel that you are to be pure before me. You're not, I don't want the leaven to be worked in. We see this throughout Israel coming into the land. God said, hey, look, when you come into the land, get rid of everything that's there. Get rid of the people, get rid of their idols, get rid of their stuff, because if you don't, you're going to fall, because you're going to start merging their garbage in with the pure word that I'm giving you, and you'll create this thing that is an obscenity. Okay, and so when Israel went in, what did they do? They didn't get rid of everything. They allowed some of the people to stay. Matter of fact, they, they started marrying some of the people that were there, their children, and, and they started bringing into the pure people that God had called for and created for himself, and they, they started making this, this ugly thing where we go and we worship in the temple and then we go home and we worship to, to the stars and then we go to the tree and, and we worship to these gods and, and then we go down into the valley and we worship to these gods and, and God, actually God tells them at one point, you know what, shut the gate to my temple. I don't even want you offering to me anymore because it means nothing to you. Okay? This whole week is a reminder that God expects His people to be holy. Now keep in mind that the law was put into place to make us aware of sin. Okay, If you didn't know that stealing was bad, it wouldn't be a sin to you. But because now you know, and if you haven't heard before now, stealing is bad. Okay, Now you know. Now you're accountable to that knowledge. Okay, But the law could not bring about the righteousness that was required by God. So why did God give them the law? To be this huge flashing neon sign to their need for a Savior. This is what is so significant about the law coming into place. Was the law bad? Absolutely not. It is not. But it, it, it couldn't do what it required of itself. The absolute justice of God could never be met by people striving to meet the law. Heck, they couldn't follow one command in the garden. They couldn't follow Ten Commandments at the Mount Sinai. And then they get all of these other, what, what is it, Dennis, 613? 613. 613 commands. 
So this feast is a reminder of the purity that God is calling His people to. Why is this significant to us? Because when Jesus became the Passover lamb, He was without blemish. We looked at the history of this. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, He came in on lamb selection day. He came as a lamb. And then He presented Himself in the temple courts to be examined. He was examined by the Herodians, by the Pharisees, by the Sadducees, by the people. And he was found to be without sin, without flaw, without blemish. So when Jesus went to the cross, not only did he go as our sacrificial lamb, as that price that set us free, but he did so in absolute purity and righteousness with no leaven found in him. Why is that important? Because it's because of that, Hebrews tells us, that we have a righteousness not our own, that He went to the cross. First, uh, Hebrews chapters 9 and 10 tell us that when, when He went to the cross, He accomplished three things. The first was that He made holy the heavenly tabernacle. Scripture tells us that when, when God commanded a tabernacle to be built, and then again in the temple, that everything had to be anointed, both with oil and with blood, to make it holy, to sanctify it. Jesus, by His sacrifice, sanctified the, whole, the heavenly tabernacle. Please don't write and ask the pastor question saying, wasn't it already holy because it's in heaven? I don't know how that works. If God has showed what that is about in here, I haven't read it with understanding yet. Okay, I don't know why that had to happen, but Hebrews says He did. The second thing, Hebrews chapter 10, was He made payment for all of the sins of the saints that had already gone on. Okay? Now keep in mind, we believe, according to the Scripture, that when a, a believer died prior to Christ, they were, they were put in a holding place. Uh, scripture calls it Abraham's bosom. Okay? It was a place where they were ministered to, but it was not heaven. Okay? Yes? Did that include Adam? Did that include Adam? It's a good question. I don't know. Because Scripture doesn't tell us whether or not he believed. It tells us that he sinned, and we see from a couple of references when Eve gave birth to their children that she had some measure of faith, but Scripture doesn't tell us about Adam's faith. We don't know. Um, quite honestly, it could be a toss of a dice. I don't know. But I'll find out one day. <laughs> um, so the, the second thing, he paid for their prices. As a matter of fact, when, when Jesus rose up, Scripture tells us that he led a train with them. I believe that is speaking to all of the people that were in Abraham's bosom. Guess what? You got a ticket to ride, baby. You're going home. <coughs> and, and they are now in heaven. Okay? The third thing that he did, which is actually joined together with the second thing, is all of our sins, all of the New Testament believer and on that believe our sins are covered. The price is paid for us so that when we go home, should that be through giving up the ghost in this life, or He comes and takes us, we will stand before Him and, and we stand in a righteousness not our own. We're covered by the blood. And He looks at us and says, your price is paid. Okay? And, and, and then we move on to uh, where our works are judged to see what was worthy. Everything tested as though by fire. So, um, so three things done. <clears throat> the Feast of Unleavened Bread is significant. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, Paul writes, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 5, He's talking about the, uh, the, the sin in the church and, and he brings in this kind of interesting connection to the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and he tells us that we need to keep the feast but, but not the feast with the old leaven, the, the leaven of malice and judgment but with the, the new leaven. And, and uh, you know people look at that and they go, oh, see, we're supposed to keep the, at least the Passover or, or at least the unleavened bread. But if you look at what he's saying, he's taking that and he's, he's saying this has been fulfilled. And, and as a body of believers, having received the fulfillment of this, this is how we should live. Okay? Now, I don't believe there's a directive to us saying, okay, you know, you've you got to do the Passover, you've got to do the Seder, you've you got to read the Haggadah, you've you got to go through the seven weeks, no leaven in the house. And, and, and all of that, I, don't, I think what he's saying is, look, 
We have been changed. We've been transformed. And it's because of the Passover. It's because the feast have been accomplished in the blood and, and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that we of necessity have to change. Because we've got to be like Him. Amen? Amen. 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 So Feast of Unleavened Bread. I, I, boy, I know, Jeannie, I really squished it. I, 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 seriously, I read about three quarters of a page of notes and I've got almost five. So, um, <clears throat> I would encourage you, if you have, and you, I'm not even going to say if you have interest, I'm going to tell you, I'm encouraging you to be interested. Uh, if you want some more information about the feasts, um, please wait till I'm done, because I'm already using Dennis and Jeannie's stuff. <laughs> okay, when, when I'm done with it, then you can have it. Um, but really, there's a lot of information out there. Uh, I'm just barely scratching the surface, folks. Uh, I'm rubbing a little bit off that dim mirror, that dim glass, so we can get a glimpse through and see what God is doing, what He started off thousands of years ago, what He accomplished 2,000 years ago, and where we're headed next. Okay? Because it's full of hope and it's full of light. Father, we bless You this morning. I thank You, Father, that there is not a word in Your Scriptures that is there without reason. I thank You, Father, that You speak to us through your word, that you have given us your spirit, that our minds might perceive, that we might understand, that we might have hope. And I thank you, Father, that that the, the feast of the Passover, the feast of the unleavened bread is accomplished for us. And Father, we look forward to the Sabbath rest that is yet to come. We thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat>